Speaking Our Peace. My name is Annie Luck. Speaking Our Peace is a podcast where individuals from around the world share their stories of nonviolent activism in their communities. Although we may be far from one another, we are all united on the long road to justice and peace through nonviolence. In today's episode, we share with you a conversation I had with Jill Carr Harris. Jill grew up in Toronto, Canada, with an interest in international development, a chance opportunity to work as an intern at the United Nations in New York back in the 1980s, put Jill on a long journey over the last four decades to learn about nonviolence and Gandhian philosophy. It's a very funny story. I, in, I came down for a march in New York. You know, it was um, June of 1985 where there was this huge peace march. A million people walked from the UN to Grand Central Park. And uh, I was part of that. I came down with a bunch of Canadians on a Elvis Presley kind of pink bus, you know, all very um, eccentric. Uh, and I joined this march and I remember coming back and I stopped, I, uh, stopped to meet somebody and they said, you know, there's this woman at the UN who's interested, her name's Sally Swing Shelley. Uh, she's interested to have an intern to work in, in her department because um, she's in the Department of Information and they're trying to set up this peace and disarmament unit. So I stayed on in New York and didn't go back on the bus and went to meet Sally Swing Shelley the next Monday morning. And sure enough, got an internship at the UN. Um, and um, Annie, what happened was um, I, be, I suddenly found myself in really what I wanted to do in life, which was to talk about peace and to understand peace. And there were, there were marvelous people who were working uh, on peace at that time, because you may remember the Cold War was at its height and uh, people were still, you know, when we grew up, uh, we would be taught how to uh, go under our desks in case there was an atomic bomb, you know? So we lived with this uh, sense um, of, um, of always the potential of a nuclear war. So do, while I was doing this internship, I went and signed up at Columbia University's International Affairs uh, Department, School of International Affairs, because there was an agreement between the UN and this particular uh, International Relations Department at Columbia. And uh, I started taking courses and becoming aware of real politique and peace and the difference um, in international relations, why peace was important. And, uh, and I carried on and worked um, at the UN as an intern. Somewhere around the end of the first year, Sally Swing Shelley said, look, you need to, um, if you want to work longer at the UN, uh, you should go over to another office and work on an international youth project which is uh, an environmental project. And she said, you know, environment is integral to peace. And so even though you may be switching to uh, looking at reforestation, planting trees, getting young people engaged, uh, think of it as a peace project. So I said, okay. And so I went over to another department and joined and actually got paid work. Um, and that started me on a whole uh, four-year uh, program of learning about development. And during that time, I um, not only got to know the, the development organizations in North America uh, who interfaced with the UN and from Europe, but also was able to go to Haiti and understand some of their problems. I went to Senegal and West Africa and I came to India. It was coming to India in 1985. So I came and I had a six month stint of work in, uh, in India, which I, I began to undertake. And it was a piece of work bringing the NGOs and government and uh, 
and the UN agencies together into a planning around uh, converting wastelands into productive lands through reforestation and so on. And it was, uh, it was somewhere in that moment, Annie, that I realized the UN was not, was in the name of poor people, really not helping poor people in the sense that the reforestation that I was looking at was actually to get poor people to do the labor, to plant trees on lands, which richer farmers would benefit from. So I began to suddenly see that this very agency of the UN, which I had you know, thought was the best uh, agency, when I got to the grassroots level, I realized that it had very negative impacts. And so within about, just before the end of my, my second contract, because they get used to give contracts in those days, uh, I resigned from the UN. I said, you know, I'm not gonna be part of something that doesn't help grassroots people because that's what they say they do. You know, they work on poverty eradication. And so um, I left the UN and I remember, don't know if you know Vandana Shiva, she was someone I knew at that time, she's a very big environmentalist. Uh, she said to me, she said, Jill, people spend a lifetime getting a job at the UN. What are you doing? Leaving. Um, and I laughed and said, you know, um, I really want to identify with grassroots communities and not big institutions. So I went on from there and set up my own organization called South South Solidarity. Because you know what, Annie, even though I got to know a lot about India's development over the years, my interest was always to take that information and exchange it with other developing countries because I saw India in a privileged position in terms of development. Yes, a lot of poverty, uh, but there was huge technical and development skills. And compared to the Senegal and Haiti, the two other countries that I had uh, spent time in, uh, I found they were way ahead and why couldn't they share knowledge across the South borders? And so I worked for about 10 years building up a group in India that just did that, that took Indians on exposure visits to China and Vietnam and Senegal and Burkina Faso and so on. Uh, and then brought that experience back to India, uh, the experience of those countries. And it was really fantastic. It was really fantastic. It was at the same time that the former prime minister of India, Manmohan Singh, before he became prime minister, he was running the South Commission. He also believed, you know, so there was a lot of, um, in the late 80s, in the early 90s, it was it was full of life and interest. We wanted to create in South Asia another European Union, you know, a kind of a regional body so we wouldn't have to go to war with Pakistan anymore. Nonviolence came up really as an issue because of the social conflict. And it, it came up because the only way to protect poor people against rich people is to arm them with nonviolence. Nonviolent action, nonviolent techniques, nonviolent strategies. There's never um, a possibility they can gain enough implements of war to fight anyway, a violent game. They'll always be on the losing end. But that wasn't really the reason. The reason was that they had the moral upper hand. You know, when you have someone perpetuating an injustice against you, you have the moral upper hand and you need to use it in a way that is to your strategic advantage. And uh, 
you know, Gandhi gave the language, the vocabulary of how to do that in a moral way, as opposed to doing that in, a, in an instrumentalized way. And I think uh, I slowly began to see the value of helping to teach and train people in nonviolence so that when they face social conflict, they could be calm, they could make good decisions, they could let their egos go, they could build in, in mass numbers, uh, they could you know, find the way to advance their issues forward. Now, I was um, part of a very big movement and uh, the movement leadership, one of the leaders is my partner and husband. So clearly uh, the leaders were making these decisions, not me. But I, I understood that nonviolence was something that I could contribute to. And so I went back and did a master's degree and then later enrolled as, in a doctoral degree. And so I went back to try to find out about nonviolence and nonviolent action and how the, my master's thesis was actually on that. How do you uh, see a Gandhi nonviolent movement in the whole uh, nonviolent literature? Because uh, there's a lot of academic literature in the United States in particular, in Europe also, uh, where they're looking at what constitutes a nonviolent movement building process. And um, so I looked at the Gandhian side of that. Uh, it, was, it was extremely helpful, but you realize at the end of the day that it's only as helpful as if you can bring that back into action, right? Because otherwise it's, um, it's just for, um, you know, small academic consumption. Uh, so I came back after, uh, writing that thesis and, and got uh, inspired to really begin to do uh, nonviolent work with people outside of India again. So just like I had 20 years before in So So Solidarity, now I was trying to figure out how do you take this Gandhian nonviolence, which is so rich in the Indian heritage and how do you take it out to other countries? But what was unique about India is that Gandhi had created a nonviolent freedom struggle. And he created that freedom struggle uh, nonviolently. There were many other people part of the freedom struggle, but he added this dimension of nonviolence. So what is that dimension? This is very, very important distinction because many of us have joined a nonviolent protest. So is like a freedom struggle, just a group of protests that are nonviolent. And that's not quite how Gandhi saw it. Gandhi saw that if you're going to struggle against an injustice, you have to also look at your own violence within and purify yourself as you are fighting an injustice outside. So um, this was really a very, very important uh, distinction because most people who are social activists, Annie, I know you know this, tend to see all of the problems as systemic and outside, but they disconnect it from themselves. And uh, Gandhi was one who brought agency back into this idea of social struggle. <clears throat> and, um, and so, you know, uh, when I came back, I joined uh, one of our big marches, you know, in 2012, the big march was called um, the Jan Satyagraha, it means the people's Satyagraha. Satyagraha means nonviolent protest. Um, and uh, we had 100,000 people we mobilized who walked, who were going to walk 
350 kilometers to Delhi, but the government was so worried about what that would mean in the city of Delhi that they met us halfway and they gave in to the land reform uh, requests that we had been making. Now, this, this, um, these requests were part of a long-term advocacy program that I started off in 2000 and 2001. And uh, many other people have really created very sophisticated advocacy. So we had some real policy asks and the government responded and they started to roll out land reform after our march in a very serious way. Uh, and it was very, um, it was very um, energizing that getting 100,000 people to walk 12 days and the government responding. In fact, you know, this is extra, extra parliament, parliamentary. In other words, uh, normally all policies will, will be in the legislatures uh, or in the parliament. Uh, but this was a case that a minister representing the prime minister came and spoke to 100,000 people and agreed to a land reform uh, agenda. And so we were elated in 2012. Uh, unfortunately, it was it rolled out for about a year and a half. And then the um, next government came in, that is the Narendra Modi government, and they were not interested in this. So they completely sidelined this effort. So uh, unfortunate as it was, we were not able to sustain this land effort in spite of 100,000 people walking for 12 days towards Delhi. Anyway, these kinds of experiences, Annie, led me to understand that Gandhi's nonviolent organizing is not just about doing meditation or getting a small group to be nonviolent, you know. It can be a huge mass movement, as I saw in 2012. And it was with that interest that Rajkopal. Uh, one of the leaders of Ekta Parish, the leader of Ekta Parish, in fact, uh, and I started to take these lessons of the Jan Satyagraha out to many countries around the world. Uh, we went to, say, 15 different countries, Latin America, Africa, Europe, Asia, and help them to understand what this Gandhian nonviolent movement building is all about. And it was during that, that was in 2013, 2014. I had also, by the way, just started my PhD. And all of these events, I would say the whole Jai Jagat sat while I was also writing, uh, you know, uh, working on a doctoral dissertation, which really informed both ways inform my research and the research certainly informed these actions. And so I worked, uh, we traveled into these, you know, more than two dozen countries in 2013, 2014. And then we brought together, Annie, we brought together 30 youth from across the world, trained them for 15 days in, in India and then sent them back to their countries to start to mobilize for the Jai Jagat. So already we had decided that we would have an international march and, um, and that that march would be just a means for people to see nonviolent action, social movement building outside India still working and working on a global level. Uh, and so we spent four months walking in India, 2,500 kilometers with this 50 people. And it turned out to be amazing because 
<clears throat> what happened was, is that people were, every village, every town, people gathered, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. People brought our breakfast, our lunch, our dinner. We stayed in schools. Do you know for four months with 50 people, we didn't spend any money. I, I kid you not. I kid you not. We were looked after by everybody. It could be the state, could have been NGOs, could have been farmers, could have been communities. But we had people looking after us full time. And not only that, Annie, you'll be surprised to know, we raised money. There were thousands and thousands of people that gave us money, small money. You know, this is the magic of one. You know, all you need is one rupee. And if, uh, you know, a thousand people give, you get a thousand rupees, you know. So uh, we collected a great deal of money, which was thank thankfully coming now because we knew we didn't have enough to make it to Geneva. And we had started because we said we were going to start, but we, we were quite poorly managed because many promises of people of giving us money didn't come through. So uh, we were short of money when we started. Anyway, we collected a lot of money along the way. And then after completing four months in India, uh, we, we sent a group to Nepal. And then those Nep Indians that, and international people that went to Nepal geared up a Nepali group who went to Pakistan, like a relay, because Indians could not go to Pakistan. So we sent Nepalese to Pakistan. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and then a group went to UAE. And then, of course, uh, just as we were starting all this, Soleimani and Iran was shot. And we thought there was going to be a war between Iran and the US. And, but still, we went. We sent a group uh, to uh, Iran because we, didn't, we couldn't send a big group as planned because of the, the war conditions. But they did an amazing peace effort over 3,000 kilometers over one month. And then, uh, and then a group went to Armenia and started walking through the mountains of Armenia uh, in the dead of winter, so through winter snow and so on. And then we all converged in Armenia on the, uh, on the 5th or 3rd of March. And we had one week before, our, almost one and a half weeks before the pandemic uh, came to Armenia and we had to call off the march. So uh, what we, you know, in, in looking back, uh, we managed to cover six countries. We managed to, even though it was a bit disjointed, but you can't help if there's a war. So we did six countries, we did almost six months we spread our message far and wide. We had a large virtual uh, group watching us. And say in Armenia, we stayed in 17 schools, um, you know, met the children, all these rural schools, and they all knew about Gandhi. And if they didn't, we told them about Gandhi and Jai Jagat and and, you know, these are areas that are now um, fighting a war with Azerbaijan. But we did a lot of peace work when we were there between Azerbaijan and Armenia. And um, I think uh, that um, it's very unfortunate that there's a, a warlike situation there. But I also know there's a deep desire for peace. And this will eventually uh, get sorted, get sorted out. Rajaji, uh, Rajkopal, my partner, and I stayed on in Armenia for two months and did something very, very interesting. We, we had um, one month of nonviolent webinars on what does nonviolence look like? And we talked to thousands and thousands of Armenians. Um, so we feel that it was time well spent. Um, and then we came back to India. 
did another months long round of webinars uh, on, um, you know, again, on uh, peace issues, various peace issues with groups around the world and did a, an interesting day long webinar on nonviolent leadership. And, and then found that with the Armenian webinars and the Indian webinars, we expanded our base, our Jai Jagat base. Um, even if we couldn't walk, we were doing a virtual walk, so to speak. And then um, we did another one in September. And since you participated in, in it, Anna, you know, uh, we did a, a week long a group of webinars in September. But what was interesting is that the people internationally that went back to France decided that they would complete the march. This, is, this was just incredible. So uh, 140 people from seven locations walked into Geneva, some walking as much as 900 kilometers most around 300 kilometers. They walked into Geneva to be there on the very day that our Jai Jagat March was supposed to enter. They had a meal the next day and they went back saying, this is the beginning of a whole series of marches that is to happen between uh, 2021 and 2030. And the reason they wanted 2021 to 2030 is for, for two, two reasons. Firstly, because the SDGs uh, are, are, are supposed to conclude, we're supposed to have eradicated poverty and many other things by 2030. So 2030 was a very important date in terms of the SDGs. But 2030 is also important because the next 10 years, what we do with our planet is, is very crucial to human survival. And so they want to now in Europe, take these marches yearly and really build up a, a European campaign along with the global campaign to take Jai Jagat to 2030. And I think what is really interesting, Annie, is when our vision had been that it was Indian leadership bringing the march from India to Geneva. And suddenly what we found is this French groups picked up the Gandhian techniques and ran their own marches without Indians into Geneva. Can you believe that? So this, this was really a transfer of knowledge or, you know, this, this is not generally what academics see as transfer of knowledge, transmission of knowledge. But I think uh, this was amazing, amazing. And these people who walked into Geneva walked through snow, through the lower Alps, through difficult conditions, sleeping in tents or sleeping. This is a COVID period. Mm -hmm. So it took guts, not, this is not uh, simple. So everything converged in Geneva. And then we had our last week of webinars and a final celebration on Gandhi's 151st birthdays on October 2nd, day of international day of nonviolence. And this was really uh, the end of the year. You know, we completed this full year. And I, I guess just to conclude the Jai Jagat part, to say that, um, you know, nonviolent organizing is a lot about resilience, being strategic, finding the way forward when there's obstacles, you know, and not giving up. I mean, the idea of trying to overcome, uh, you know, is a very, is very, very central to the kind of nonviolence that Gandhi modeled during the freedom struggle.
I had no idea when I was coming to India that I would be part of a Gandhian movement. And even one of the leaders of the Jai Jagat movement, um, I had no idea. And certainly in, in the orbit of my growing up, uh, you know, it was to be a doctor, lawyer, or nurse, not to be, you know, over in India with a Gandhian movement. Um, so uh, breaking through all of those structures uh, has been enormously um, creative experience, very, very challenging. And um, I think the challenge is learning how to live with conflict, learning how to hold conflict. And this is essential to the training that we give. You know, we do a lot of nonviolent trainings. And essential to the training is how do you use, um, you know, conflict uh, in a way that is transformative. Uh, because, you know, conflict can make you suffer like anything. And so it's the human impulse to avoid suffering. Uh, but how do you use that in a way to shape uh, not only your own transformation, but shape events outside? And it, you know, it means you have to really learn to hold conflict, befriend conflict, and not avoid conflict. So um, if people tell you that nonviolence is about not having conflict, then it isn't the Gandhian nonviolence and it isn't going to lead to social change. It may make people feel more peaceful in, inwardly, but Gandhi linked the inner and outer, the internal peace with the external social change process or social injustice. And it's really that link which is so profound and it requires a certain kind of formation and training. So people in India have that formation because deep in the Indian um, ideas, culture, a bit like Chinese, but uh, is that there's a unity, you know? And we unfortunately in the West uh, because of scientific and technological progress, had a way of thinking that bifurcated knowledge and didn't allow for you, you, you know, a sense of unity in our thinking. And therefore, uh, we, we have really divided against ourselves over and over again. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. The greatest problem is the bifurcation, the polarization of politics. That in a way is, is the most um, unfortunate part. And one has to go to the root of that, not just see the symptoms. And going to the root of it then forces you to see your role as part and parcel of the root of the problem. And, um, and so it's not easy, you know, but um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's possible through training and through formation to get this unity thinking, to get out of this bifurcated thinking. I think, um, you know, my own writings today, it's all about changing the syntax, changing the way of expression, changing the narrative, uh, to reflect this unity uh, that uh, is so, so important in conflict resolution, in, ga in gaining youth to get involved in, in social issues. Uh, this is so important, this unity of thinking. And uh, Gandhi still provides a lot for us to learn from. You know, there's been two generations since his death, but there's a whole tradition uh, that unlocks some of the secrets of how to hold conflict and, and uh, try to navigate uh, with greater peace 
So just to conclude to say, Gandhi said that peace is not the goal, peace is the path. And it's everyday peace that one has to create through this unity that I've referred to through, through trying to find inherent peace in interpersonal, uh, inter-societal relations. So uh, the Jai Jagat for me was part of that learning process uh, and, uh, and was a wonderful opportunity to, to bring people together and continues to be until 2030 because it's, it's captured the imagination of so many. Thanks for listening. Remember, there are all kinds of opportunity around us to take us towards peace and justice. It could be a bus that we decide to take or a bus that we decide not to take. You never know how your story of nonviolence and peace may turn out, but do know that you are in good company. Speaking Our Peace is produced by Andy Luck, Ashima Vishnoi, Priya Joshi, and Reva Joshi. We can be reached by email at speakingourpeace at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Our Peace Podcast, or check out our website, speakingourpeace.com. Our music is made by Sun Bear. Until next time.